Hello, purple man. You said I should join your party on a quest? But of course. This is an RPG, so I should take on every quest I come across. It's the only way to properly play those. <coughs> oh, it's that kind of game. Felvedek is a game about a drunken knight named Pavel, who's having the worst weekend of his life since his wife left him. But before we get into the game itself, I need to disclose something. I have a personal connection to the game. You see, I usually follow games in the making. Indie projects and whatnot I would love to do a video about once they are out of early access. It usually takes them 20 years and millions of dollars earned at the cost of hair follicles. But what started a year ago with me following the developer of Felvedeck on Twitter evolved into me falling in love with the guy. I'm amazed by how passionate he is about his game and the history of his country. He also has a genuinely nice sense of humor. So I played the demo, bought the game on the release date and enjoyed every single second of it. And while this video isn't a sponsored one, you could treat it as such. Because I'm biased. I like the guy and I wish him all the best in life. Shout out to Brozov, hope you're doing well. Our journey starts like a typical adventure for a man in his late 20s and early 30s. In the middle of a bender, some shit blows up and somehow becomes your problem. This time it's a castle next door. No one has lived there since the Hussites ransacked it a long time ago, but your lord, Yosef, still wants you to go and check what's going on there. But before we can do that, he will berate you about your never-ending drinking problem, which started way before your wife left you and became much worse afterwards. He goes as far as getting on a high horse about not using coping mechanisms like that after he lost his wife. Then he immediately offers to play board games, which is objectively even worse than drinking. Trust me, I've tried both and I've never spent as much money on alcohol in one night as I did on that damn Divinity tabletop game. To make sure we don't get derailed after the first battle of wine we find, Joseph forces a monk named Matei to babysit us. Neither he nor Pavel enjoy this collaboration, but they both agree to try their best to make it work. And after Matei joins you, you will finally realize the game is made on the RPG Maker engine. Yes, this is a Slovakian JRPG, an SJRPG. We are one letter away from summoning the worst people on the internet. And we've pushed it enough already with the whole historical accuracy aspect of the game about a medieval knight. By that point, some of you may have paused the video a few times and noticed what language everyone uses in dialogues. I can only assume that this is as close to authentic translation as we can get, since the game is set in the 15th century Slovakia, a region of Upper Hungary at that time. And this region was called Filvedek back then. Game title mentioned, roll credits. I'm joking. Some of you might point out that Slovakia didn't exist in the 15th century as it was under the rule of Hungary. This deafening silence was a cue for everyone who wanted to hear your history lesson to voice their opinion. Just let us enjoy things, we don't need your input. People talk funny and it's all that matters. After you steal everything you can find in the new castle, you take a nice little walk across the countryside to the old castle. And it's doing just as great as my bank account. You also find a dead ottoman next to a castle. I'm sure some of my viewers would find it beautiful. And speaking of beautiful, the art direction of the game is pulling some insane weights. Some of you are doing cuckoo signs right now, but I said what I said. This game is not as beautiful as titans like Hades, which was created by a team of 20 plus people. But for a game where all art, and I mean all of it, was created by just one guy, it's an insane achievement. It's already hard to make all 2D assets look organic and maintain a consistent style. But doing it in an art style that I can only describe as depressed European with a brush tool and adding 3D cutscenes that maintain that amazing style is close to a miracle. And the art direction conveys a very specific feeling about life that Powell has, being a traumatized and depressed knight, he sees everything around him in the same light. Washed out colors, no focus on the faces of people he's about to kill and a general inability to notice anything beautiful around him. I don't know how Brozov pulled that off, but it's a testament to his abilities. It's an insane level of quality for a first released game of such scale. And it's all accompanied by a soundtrack that takes everything to the next level, starting with the opening scene. adding some much-needed melancholy to the overworld.
and ending with the fighting track so good that I'm still listening to it while I work on this video. Marcel Gedo's Holy Crap is an amazing band and it was a great choice for the game. They elevated it to even higher levels than I thought was possible. In the castle we find two things, a strange seat and an even stranger contraption with an unknown purpose. And after we leave the castle, two guys in purple jump us trying to end our adventure preemptively. Fighting in field deck is serviceable. It's your usual RPG maker fighting that consists of picking the right option in the menu and deciding which poor soul will get shield bashed by Powell this turn, while Matei spams attack. It's not an easy game, but it's also not that hard. Every fight, except for a few that are clearly meant to be unwinnable, can be won if you give it at least some thought before spamming attack on the largest enemy. Which also works as a tactic if you are willing to run back to the altar and heal after each fight. And Filvedek uses its art style and sound effects to convey that the guy you just hit has the worst time of his life. Here, stay a while and listen. This, combined with the fact that enemies are not bullet sponges, makes you feel the weight of each blow you are UPSing to your enemy's face. Other than that, there is not a lot to surprise you. The enemies evolve both figuratively and literally as you play, keeping you guessing what you will meet next until the very end. Through, if you are expecting some unusual or never seen before fighting mechanics, it's not that kind of game. It's just a bunch of nice tactical fights that are carefully sprinkled throughout the story. Outside of fighting, you walk around, talking to people and checking every single crate you can find for consumables. Look, I don't need to explain it in detail. It's an RPG Maker game. Playing those games comes naturally. It's in your DNA. A kid can play that game before learning how to read. Just like you did with Earthbound. You know how those games work. And after you take out the Balas gang members, you head back to the castle to tell Yosef what you found. Finding a dead Ottoman in the region is a good reason to be slightly alarmed. So Yosef writes a letter to Adam, the local inquisitor, asking him for help. This letter should be given to the local knight courier named Yanchi. He is currently in the middle of shitting himself to death after talking to Paolo's wife, Paola. She is clearly not happy to see Powell, so she slaps him and immediately leaves. <coughs> and it seems she joined a strange group of people wearing purple, but we don't have time for that. Yanchi has such a severe case of diarrhea that he can't leave the outhouse. And, from what we can gather while rescuing him from the brown light at the end of the tunnel, it was done to him by Paola. She gave him a strange drink and promised to meet him later that day. You then follow Yanchi to capture Paola and pressure her for answers. But Powell, after seeing his wife embraced by another man, gets so bad hurt he ends up getting ambushed by what seems to be the same cultist as in the old castle, trying to protect Paola. A short battle follows, giving Paola enough time to escape, and the day ends with Pali saying this shit is beyond him and going to sleep. And a cutscene that follows clearly indicates that the alternative history part of the game description was foreshadowing something much more sinister than existence of Slovakia. And we already have a good, interesting story going on. What are those weird seeds you found? How did that monster come to be? What's up with a bunch of cultists running around without any repercussions from the fashion police? How is Paula involved in all of this? Will your mother still love you if she finds out what you post on the Discord server? And this is a point of no return for the story spoilers, so I urge you not to watch the next section before you play the game. It's a cheap game with a very generous regional pricing. You can beat it in one day and solve all the mysteries yourself. Do yourself a favor and buy it. You don't need to wait for the verdict. It's a nice little adventure that I highly recommend. But if you are still unsure and want to avoid story spoilers, go to here. This is where everything goes completely off the rails. It turns out that the monster that just attacked us was the brown knight Yanchi, who had mutated overnight. After putting him on ice for the Inquisitor to inspect once he arrives, we need to gather information about the cult operating in the region. The first logical step is to visit the village where the local burgomaster resides. Everyone in the village mentions how most of the youth left it to join a strange cult. 
while Burgomaster does nothing to help them, nor does their lord Joseph. But at least he has a good reason not to. He's busy setting up the Game of Thrones board, which takes around 7 hours of preparation time. Burgomaster says that he had heard rumors of strange things happening in the region, but he never thought they were so dire. He even mentions figures that gather around the old castle, and that villagers had been talking about strange creatures and infernal howls echoing around that place. Of course, he didn't think this was strange enough to warrant an investigation. Thankfully, we are here now, so we might as well investigate the cult and mysterious seeds that the locals call Kahwa. But the situation in the village is even worse than we thought. The local bishop ignores his divine duties and spends too much time at the bathhouse, which is also a front for a brothel. Also, a local Jew was recently attacked by Hasites, and we were just robbed by a female thief who had another mutant helping her. I wonder which section on the Slovakia trial website talks about those experiences. After we got captured by a female thief, who then got attacked by cultists, things start to make more sense. The woman's name is Ida, and the monster that was with her is Dechi. He was her lover and got poisoned by the same strange drink some woman gave him. It turned him into a monster, but he came back to Ida and not the woman who poisoned him. Bishop provides another piece of the puzzle. The kahwa is actually what will be later known as coffee, and the strange seeds are just coffee beans. However, the seed we found has some strange markings on it. After we test that seed on a local chicken, it transforms into a pink monster. So, the evil coffee beans are turning people into monsters. This is a cautionary tale about what will happen to our world if we don't regulate the sales of monster energy drinks. Another piece of the info is that the Jew made painted ornate fangs for the cult so they could easily tell each other apart from locals who aren't a part of the cult yet. You can notice those fangs on Paula when you encounter her in the castle. He also knows for a fact that cultists are stationed in the fortified villa in the forest near the castle. This is enough adventuring for now, so Matei and Paul debrief at the local tower. Whoops, sorry, wrong picture. And after a very long day, Pavel opens up to Matei about his drinking problem. You see, he was captured after the Battle of Kosovo and was one step away from death. So close, in fact, that a sword was already pressing against his throat. If not for a miracle of a cannon shot that saved him, he wouldn't be standing here. Danger might have passed long ago, but a touch of cold steel on his neck follows him around to this day and goes away only when he drinks. Another day starts with us helping a cultist survive being baptized by Hasites, so we can infiltrate their ranks. Their current plan goes like this. Gather enough members and mutants with the funds provided by someone named Root, then take out all the Hasites in the region and eventually get rid of the current leader of the Upper Hungary. And all of this will be accomplished through the power of their lord and savior, Zurvan. If you are lost as to what the hell is Zurvan, it makes two of us. Also, they all sound like communists, being surprised that the Lord, despite doing almost nothing, is wealthier than any of them. They say that they are unable to understand how that's even possible, but are certain that if they kill him, everything will be well. Me too, Purple Man. Me too. But for now, our mission is to get accepted into the cult. They ask us to steal a mural from Joseph's chamber, which turns out to be a pornographic picture painted on the wall. So, he's a board game geek and a coomer. I think there were some lords in my family tree, because I see too many similarities between us. Back at Burgomaster's house, you may run into the middle of a coffee exchange operation. A local dwarf and the Burgomaster explain that they are part of a larger chain of coffee distribution across the realm. Like everyone else, they were approached by a mysterious Root. Everything was running smoothly, but eventually Root started to threaten them with dire consequences if they would defy him. This explains why Burgomaster didn't take any actions against the cultists. But those two weren't just complying with all insane demands. They found another contact to keep coffee flowing and gathered weapons and allies across the realm to push back against the cult. After he helped Burgermaster escape, it's presumed he goes on to gather more supporters to fight against the cult. Inside the cursed village of people unable to deal with their problems without your help, there is a family that just lost their daughter, Anichka. When you find her, she's already thinking about jumping off the cliff, but asks you to find her boyfriend first. And you find him grinding Miller's son so hard the poor guy might not walk the next day. Well, hey, beats joining a cult, I guess. After you tell Anichka what you just witnessed, she jumps off the cliff. Only to be saved by Matei, which gives her a new perspective on life. She renounces her belief in Zuvran and offers to spy on the cult for you. Maybe more people who are members of an insane and obscure cult should follow her steps. We won't be saving them. 
After doing all that side fun, you finally present the stolen mural to the cultists and get to meet one of the higher-ups. It's not rude, this guy is just in charge of the operations. In short, a useless middle manager. To make sure you are truly committed to their cause, you get your final assignment. Find a guy named Bogdan, kill him and bring his ass cheek as proof of the kill. There is a tattoo on it that the middle manager will recognize. At this point, you have two options. You can either go after Bogdan or you can find a secret entrance to the cultist fort. Whichever you do, you will be ready to attack them with Josef's help. Or you can do what I did, cut off Bogdan's ass without killing him and tell the lord that there is a secret passage. This way, Bogdan knows his suffering was for naught. Assault on the cultist fort gives you even more insight into what's going on. Root is an agent of the Sultanate and he uses the cult to destabilize the region. And the middle manager you just killed was about to betray Root, your wife Paula and someone named Mar. He was even celebrating the first caravan of coffee brought independently of Root's influence. An unfortunate blunder on your part. If anything, you just help Root by killing people who were planning to betray him. But there's still hope, a meeting is scheduled at the tavern today and you still have time to make it there. Since you are supposed to be sober, Matei suggests switching clothes. He will drink and talk to Root without the risk of you going haywire the moment you test Boravichka on your lips. And the things start out well enough. Root even takes a look at the evil coffee bean and explains that it's not something Ottomans produce. But then a mysterious knight arrives who knows Root. Matei drunkenly challenges the knight to a duel and loses it in two rounds. Thankfully, Pavel is still standing, so he drinks with this knight who introduces himself as Marek. While they are talking, Pavel learns about the Marek's job. Turns out he works with Root to locate merchants who can sell coffee. So basically he's a sales guy, and also the third person middle manager planned to betray. Drunken and tired, Pavel heads to bed because there's nothing left to do for now. He wakes up to find the entire tavern full of dead bodies and cultists kidnapping Matei. It seems they mistook him for Pavel. If I was Pavel, I would have looked into never going to sleep again. Every time he does it, something terrible happens. While all of this is happening, Paula decides to tie loose ends on her part. She finds Pavel at the tavern and he still wants her to come back. It's clear she's one of the key members of the cult, but that doesn't stop him in the slightest. Sadly, it's just not meant to be. In the next section, we briefly play as Paola. She meets Marek, who's trying to control Ahriman, the big guy with a giant torch for a head living under the old castle. Marek also talks nonsense about becoming immortal and almost kills Paola, but she escapes. Then Marek gets rid of Root and becomes the sole leader of the cult. During these events, Paola had an insane fever dream, which ended much better than it should have. Yeah, we now have a flaming sword that seems to have been received from God. Also, Adam, the local inquisitor, finally arrives and finds us. There is not much else to do, so we go straight to Josef. He has already got a ransom note telling him that if he wants to have Matei back, he should come to a barn behind the castle. We arrive to negotiate the safe release of Matei. <coughs> oh, okay, Adam is a member of the Puritan branch of Order Maleus. I can respect that. We are now in the end game. Cultists attack the village and Marek leads the assault. After we defeat them, Marek seemingly disappears. Since we have a flaming sword, we go to see the Jew and ask him if we can use his balloon to fly to the blown up castle. We find Ahriman there, who explains the idea behind the cult. 
Unsurprisingly, it's rooted in racism, genocide, and Austro-Hungarian supremacy. So, just your average, country-specific subreddit comment section. He even offers Powell to join his crusade against the Ottomans, whom he considers the root of all evil. Powell refuses that offer on account of mucho texto. Wow, that's a lot of words. Too bad I'm not reading them. After inspecting murals in the old castle, we discover a secret passage beneath the village. Also, here you can see a mural explaining how to make mutants. I won't tell you how they are created, you will have to play the game. It's not that I'm being secretive, I just can't keep it together every time I try to read the sentence explaining how it works. And after we go into the literal belly of the beast, we find the remaining forces of the cult and meet Marek again. He's already ascending, but unlucky for him, there's no mystery that Powell and Matei can't solve. And this mystery is solved in three simple steps. The day is saved and our heroes go on to live their happily ever after. But before that, Powell has a final talk with his wife. He asks her one last time if she still loves him. And her answer is so cruel, it's the only time we see Powell without his signature smile. Even if she doesn't love him, he still loves her. To help his wife avoid the wrath of locals, he shows her how to safely escape using the flying balloon. It is the tragic end of the relationship, but we don't know what exactly happened between them prior to the events of the game. Whatever it was, Powell still deserves a happy life. But, sadly, he ends up joining another crusade against the Ottomans. What a nice story it was. It's pretty decent for something that was written by two guys as their first big project. I don't know which bits were written by Josef and which were by Vlado, but huge kudos to both of them. If you are one of those people who watched story spoilers before playing the game, I avoided talking about any interesting quests and omitted enough details, so you should still get your fair share of surprises when you play the game. And if you already played the game, get ready for the DLC that's coming out soon. I give Firvedek 10 euros out of no sales, because Brozov said so. This game is a great first release that falls short only in terms of length. You can finish it in roughly 4 to 6 hours depending on how fast you can read. But for me, it's not a bad thing. I for once like it when a game leaves you wanting more and not hoping for this slugfest to be finally over. If you like the video, please subscribe to my channel. There will be even more videos like that. Thank you, love and kisses, bye. This game is a perfect example of why you should do your own side projects. After Brozov released Felvedek, his next big announcement was that he started working in another small indie game no one ever heard of. Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. What a great start for his career. I'm pretty sure Woodworker is review bra in disguise. Just don't go into the game files to check the name of his sprite. Brozov celebrated a single Mongolian who bought his game. Said Mongolian left a positive review about the game and it's now a top scored review on the page. Every social media manager should take note, this is how you get a positive review score. William Defoe looks so much like Powell that a Twitch banner of Philvedek featured a Photoshop picture with his face in place of Powell's for multiple months without anyone noticing. And if you would like to hear more about the game and how it was made from the man himself, there is a nice interview that just came out. The link will be in a pinned comment. You can also join his Discord channel and just bombard him with questions, it seems he likes to answer them. Or at least he doesn't seem annoyed. There is no teaser for the next game on account of me not knowing what it will be. Psych! Hey,